Alrighty. Hi, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Hopefully technology is being agreeable for me. Um, so I am very excited to be here. I, I think I'm kind of the square peg in the round hole. When I was looking at the list of presenters for, for these sessions, I'm like, oh, I don't really fit in here because you've got some doctors and professors and educators and people who are top-notch experts in their fields. And then there's me. Hi, I'm a bank auditor with dogs. So um, <laughs> I really appreciate that you all showed up here to listen to me talk about dogs and what my dogs do. Um, yeah, uh, my, my plan for my little session here is to talk about what a therapy dog is, um, talk about how I got involved in doing this wacky thing called therapy dogs, and what we do, where we go, and especially, because this is what we're here for, what the dogs do in the libraries and how all that works out. Um, so I'll be sharing some stories about what my dogs have done, um, some of the stuff that we've seen, some of the stuff we've done, some of our success stories, things like that. Um, but then I'll definitely be spending some time talking about the library programs that we participate in and how I think that is making a difference. Um, so if you want to skip over to the next slide, um, first step along the way. Oh, let me throw out this too. If anybody has any questions or if you want me to talk about anything in particular, just jump in. Let me know. Um, I'm not super formal, so just let me know what you want to talk about. But anyway. Back to what are therapy dogs? Um, so this is something that um, I get asked a lot. A lot of people will ask me if, when we're out and about doing our thing if they're service dogs and they are most definitely not service dogs. And if you go to the next slide, this kind of breaks down what the differences are. Um, so Service dogs perform very specific and very important tasks for their person. Um, they are trained to perform this specific task to either enhance or save their person's life. Um, these could be things like diabetic alert dogs, um, seeing eye dogs, mobility assistance dogs, seizure alert dogs. Um, there's sleep apnea alert dogs. So if you stop breathing in your sleep, they'll wake you up. Um, and then there are even dogs that will prevent self-harm. So all of those things are super duper important. And that is totally not what my dogs do. My dogs are just very well trained, very obedient. They are cute. They are fluffy. They are even kind of funny. And they make people happy when we go to visit them wherever they go. But definitely a much different skill set. Um, therapy dogs can only go where they are invited, any places that actually allow them in there. Service dogs can go wherever their people go because their people need them. Um, so I'm always very clear about that. My guys, not service dogs in the least. Um, now in our therapy dog group, we do have some people who have service dogs that also work as therapy dogs. Um, but for me, that, that's not the case at all. Um, I mean, they're, they're really good, they're really cute, but they're not actually <laughs> functional at all <laughs> in any important way. If we go to the next slide, um, what is the next slide? Oh, how we got started. All right, and then to the next slide. Um, hopefully then, there we go, it's coming up, there we go. Okay, so this is how I got started doing therapy dog stuff with this little dog right here. So years ago, in about 2009, um, I came across a little puppy on Pet Finder in Eastern Kentucky in a very tiny shelter um, who was probably not going to be on the adoption list for very long because the shelter people thought she was deaf and they did not really want to adopt out a deaf dog. Well, at the time I had a blind dog and I thought, well, if I can train a blind dog, surely to goodness, I can train a deaf dog too. So I did a little research. I thought, okay, I can do this. And we drove out to Eastern Kentucky and rescued this dog that we named Denali or Denny and got little Denny home and quickly realized that she was not deaf. She was just a great Pyrenees and super stubborn. 
and or independent thinkers, as we like to call them. Um, but since I didn't know that she was not deaf before we adopted her, we had signed up for dog training classes through a friend of a friend said, hey, you know, this dog trainer, she's really good. Why don't you reach out to her? So we did. We signed up for classes. We went to our first class. And we had had dogs for several years. And I thought I knew things. We got to class and turned out there were a whole lot of stuff that I did not know. Um, but through this trainer, we learned a, a different way to communicate with our dogs. You know, you see on TV and things, the, the trainers that yell and jerk the leash and um, dominate the dogs. That's not what this particular trainer does. She's more of the um, help the dog make the right decision type of trainer. And I happen to like that. And I think my dogs like that too. So after we went to class for a few times with little Denny here, um, the trainer asked us if we ever considered doing therapy dog work with her. And I didn't know what that was. Um, but I said, well, if it's something I get to do with my dog, sure. So we tested little Denny and she passed with flying colors. And then that started our therapy dog journey. Um, if we go to the next slide, don't actually know what's next. Oh yeah, Possibilities Unleashed, that's the group. So the woman who runs this group, Possibilities Unleashed, she not only does obedience type classes or working with um, dogs who have behavioral concerns, but she also trains actual service dogs, the ones that I was talking about, the ones that save lives. And she runs a different section of the group called Therapy Dogs. And so she's she does it all. She's amazing. Um, I have learned so much from her over the years. And she opened the door to the thing I've been doing for the past 13 years in volunteering doing therapy dog work. So that kind of brings us to now. So if we go to the next slide, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we have to do to become a therapy dog team. And uh, if we go to the next slide, we can at least have something colorful to look at. Um, so each group is a little bit different. Um, if you Google therapy dog groups for your area, you will surely find all sorts of different things. Uh, here in Kentucky, I work with Possibilities Unleashed. They are based out of Frankfurt, but they do stuff all over the state. Here in Louisville, where I live, uh, there's a group called WAGS. They're really good too. Um, I would probably be a part of their group also if I had time, but um, <laughs> uh, it's a little busy just being a part of one right now. Before we moved to Louisville, we lived in Texas. And while we were in Texas, we were members of uh, four different local groups and one uh, national group. And so I, I tested with a whole bunch of different organizations and uh, um, I see how they're all different and they're all different, but not in bad ways. They each have different parts that I think are really good and some I think are a little bit more thorough than others. Um, in most of these groups, there's some sort of obedience training. Um, there's the canine good citizenship test and that kind of is a set test that you can put the dog through to make sure they can sit, they can stay, they can heal, they walk politely on a leash, they're not trying to jump up on people, things like that. And I think that's a good start. Some groups stop right there and that's enough, um, but other groups take it further. They throw into it some uh, real world scenarios. Um, they throw in an individual assessment. And the group that I'm with does both of those. And I, I kind of like that because that way you have a better idea of what the dogs are going to do when you get them out into the world. Uh, for the real world scenario type things, um, one group that I tested with had what they called the angry man test. And it was where they had a strange guy come in wearing a baseball cap and a big coat. And he'd run around talking really loud, waving a rolled up newspaper in his hand. And the test there was to see what's the dog going to do? Is the dog going to be afraid? Is the dog going to try to attack him? Um, I'm happy to say that my dogs did not respond poorly at all. Simon just kind of sat there and yawned. <laughs> he was not impressed by it at all. Baxter wagged his tail and thought, hey, this looks like fun. Um, so that's, that's kind of what you want. You don't want a dog that's going to uh, get defensive anytime things get a little weird. 
There's also a test called the food test or the leave it test. And that's where you put food in front of the dog and you have to tell them to leave it so they don't go after it. Uh, one group would get a can of, um, what's it called, the Vienna sausages and open it up, put it in a bowl, let it sit out for a few hours and get good and stinky. And that's really enticing to the doggies. And then you have to walk the dog past it and tell them to leave it and not have them go for the stinky sausages. Um, that's actually a really good test, I think, for dogs in general, because when you're out and about, you don't want them eating weird things off the floor. Or for us, if we go into a hospital and let's say a patient knocks their meds on the floor, you don't want the dog gobbling up somebody's unknown medication. That could be a very bad thing. If you go to the next slide, um, these are some of our credentials from the different groups. Um, these are all old, none of these are current ones. I didn't want to show our current ones, but you can see MD Anderson, uh, Caring Critters, Possibilities Unleashed, with previous dogs. The Read program, that's another good group. Um, yeah, lots of stuff that we've done. Uh, the testing will also give the dogs an opportunity to be around other dogs and to be around a lot of people to see how they do in a more crowded situation. Um, one of the groups that we worked with would put us all in an elevator and see how we did with you know, six or seven dogs in an elevator because you, you want all of the dogs that go into the elevator to come out of the elevator. And um, yeah, that, that's a pretty good test right there. Um, what else do we do? We do medical equipment tests, especially for dogs that are going to be visiting in hospitals. You don't want them to be afraid of an IV pole or a wheelchair or go after the legs of a walker. That would be kind of bad. So you can get them accustomed to that stuff before you go and deal with it um, in real life. And uh, yeah, so that's some of the stuff that we do to test dogs. Um, I'm happy to say that these guys have all done very well. Uh, and I don't think anything was especially hard for them. Um, one of the things that I had to do with Baxter was to get him to walk with me and be enthusiastic about walking with me. And he was kind of hot and it was he was tired and he was kind of dragging, so I got him really excited and he just kind of bounced along, but we still passed anyway. <laughs> All right, if we go to the next slide, um, we're gonna talk about what it takes to be a good therapy dog. So they have to be good with other animals. Um, with Possibilities Unleashed, it's just a therapy dog group, but some groups have therapy horses, they have therapy cats, pigs, bunnies, birds. I'm trying to think what else I've seen that's unusual. That might be about it. But you don't want the dog to try to eat the bird or to eat the cat or anything like that. So we want all of the animals to get along. You can see one of those pictures there. Simon's giving a cat the side eye. I promise he's okay with cats. He has to be. <laughs> if you go to the next slide, um, it's Simon with my horse. He and the horse are buddies. Um, if you go to the next slide, what else do we have here? Ah, they do have to put up with a lot of silliness. So the big purpose of us going to hospitals and uh, nursing homes is to make people happy. Um, and to do that, sometimes we have to do silly things like dress the dogs up in costumes, especially this month because Halloween is right around the corner. So pretty much all of the library visits that I've been doing this month, um, I've been dressing them up. Simon has been Harry Potter a couple of times now. Um, he has the round glasses and the Gryffindor scarf. And um, when I write it, I say that he is H-A-I-R-Y-P-A-W-T-E-R. -E so Harry Potter, yeah. Um, Anyway, if you go to the next slide, you can see some more silliness that I subject my dogs to. Um, one year, Simon and Baxter were the Blues Brothers for a Halloween thing. Um, <laughs> Simon demonstrating uh, proper masking, I guess. And then Santa, Simon is always a fun thing. And I'm, I've been surprised that the dogs wear sunglasses and other glasses pretty willingly. If you go to the next slide, um, this was Abby. Abby was a saint by wearing the giant 
tie and the giant sunglasses for over an hour at that school that we were visiting that day. Bless her heart. If we go to the next slide, they have to be willing to try new things. Because when we go into a therapy dog visit, we don't always know what we're going to be running into. Um, and by getting them to try new things, it builds the trust with our dogs so that they know that I'm not going to put them in a dicey situation. And that when I ask them to do something, they know it's going to be okay. It really is a good bonding opportunity with the dog. Um, it, if you go to the next slide, I'm trying to think what else I have in here. Uh, yeah, okay. So um, little popcorn in the bottom left-hand corner in the backpack. Popcorn can walk just fine, but since he's the smallest of my dogs right now, I thought it would be fun to get one of the canine backpacks and see if he would do it, and he absolutely loves it. Um, it's also a good workout because he weighs about 45 pounds. And if you go to the next slide, what else do we have? Uh, th these are going to get into some cute pictures, so they have to be willing to be loved and adored by everybody. Pretty much anywhere you go with your dogs and their big, fluffy, well-behaved dogs, they're going to get some attention and they kind of love it. If you go to the next slide, um, some more we visited with some military personnel over the summer at an event, some kids at another event, and then go to the next slide. Even law enforcement officers need some snuggly puppy love sometimes. And then I'm trying to think what else is next. Next slide. Okay, before I get into this, let me tell you one more thing about what it takes to do this. So there's also, what does it take to be a therapy dog handler? Um, I would say the biggest part of it is that it's a time commitment to get the training in. Uh, if you put the work in at the beginning, it makes it so much easier and much more enjoyable later on but the training is ongoing in it's an everyday thing you can easily train the dog or untrain them to do something um, just by getting a little bit lazy with them and i speak from experience on that um, but if you work hard and you you build that relationship with the dog then it can be a lot of fun and something very special to share with other people um, the primary role for me is just well, I'm mainly the dog chauffeur, but I'm there to speak for them and to make it an enjoyable thing for everybody that we visit. Um, I also, uh, it's my responsibility to make sure that the dog is feeling good, that they're not having a tummy ache or something, or that they're not feeling uncomfortable with another dog. One of the things that we do before every therapy dog visit is if we have other dogs there, we will do a meet and greet before the visit to make sure that everybody is feeling agreeable that day. If somebody's having a bad day, and it happens, we all have bad days, even dogs do, then we can maybe skip that visit that day. Maybe somebody needs to wait outside that day, and that's totally fine. But it's, it's a it's our responsibility as a handler to make sure that everybody's on the same page and that everybody's getting along and that the people that we're visiting aren't going to be subjected to any unpleasantness with the puppies. Um, so that is what we do. Um, I guess the big part is we show up and we smile and we're there to listen to people. So now let's talk about where we go and what we do. So this picture here, this is Denny at, I think that was a library in Katy, Texas, if I recall. Um, anyway, moving on to the next slide. We go to hospitals and nursing homes and hospice and airports and schools and libraries and so, so many more places. It seems like over the years, this has definitely become more of a thing. When we first started doing this, I remember getting a lot of really strange looks. Um, I remember one library visit when somebody was actually pretty unkind to me about bringing my dog into the library, which I just politely explained why we were there and what we were doing. I don't know that I convinced her, but that's okay. But nowadays, this is 
this is becoming more of a thing. Um, I know that our group gets emails very regularly about requests for us to visit places. And um, I think we're having a hard time keeping up. I, I know I can't commit to every single request that we get, mainly because I work and I just do this as I can. Um, but it, it's definitely catching on, that's for sure. So this picture here, this is from a group in Texas called The Lighthouse. It used to be called The Lighthouse for the Blind, but then I think they just changed it to be The Lighthouse. And this was a facility for vision impaired kids and adults. And every year they would do a summer camp, which is what this is from, and they would do an Easter egg hunt. And the first time I heard about the Easter egg hunt, I thought, well, that's kind of mean. You're going to hide eggs from kids who can't see. But then I found out the eggs beep. And I thought that was just brilliant. So they hide these eggs. They turn the eggs on. They go beep, beep, beep. And the kids follow the sound to find them. And I, I just thought that was adorable. It kind of drove the dogs nuts. The constant beeping was um, something new for them to learn about, too. But here you can see a whole, whole bunch of kids. And we had, what, four dogs there that day. And we learned that that was a much different way to communicate. Um, so normally when a kid sees our dogs, they say, oh, it's a really big dog. It looks like a polar bear. But for the vision impaired kids, they are much more handsy. So they might, instead of just petting the dog, they might grab a nose and say, what is this? And they might poke them in the eye by mistake. And so the dog has to be okay with all of that. Um, Denny is the dog here in this picture with me in the middle. And at one point during this visit, she was laying down on the floor and she had a dozen kids piled up on top of her laying down just, and she was soaking up every minute of it. Um, but not all dogs are like, that. I, I used to have five dogs and four of them were therapy dogs. And I used to say I have four therapy dogs and one that needs therapy. And you kind of got to figure that out. You know, what do dogs like? Some dogs like working with kids. Some dogs don't like working with kids. And so Denny, definitely liked working with kids. Simon here loves kids. And if we go to the next slide, we can see nursing homes. Um, these might be one of my favorite kinds of visits. Um, it's fun to sit with the residents of nursing homes and listen to them talk about all sorts of things. Usually they'll talk about dogs that they've had in the past. Some of the people we visit are very bossy about what we should be doing with our dogs. Um, somehow they all think that my dogs are in need of more snacks. <laughs> um, one of the ladies in the pictures here always says, well, he just looks like he needs more to eat, <laughs> which is very sweet. Kind of reminds me of my grandmother, um, but really sweet things. Uh, we also work with a lot of kids, uh, a lot of residents in memory care. And that's, that's been interesting too. That can be a little hard sometimes because you never know from one visit to the next how uh, somebody is feeling or where they are on their roller coaster. Um, but like I said, you show up and you smile and you just take it from there. And um, it, yeah, it's had some very special moments with our nursing home residents. If we go to the next slide, hospitals. Oh boy. Um, we have spent a great deal of time in hospitals. Uh, this is Abby at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston with a patient there. Blurred out, of course, for his privacy. Um, that's pretty much what we did a lot of the time at MD Anderson, is just lots and lots of snuggles. A lot of the patients there are long-term patients. So it's hard on the patients, it's hard on their families, and we're there to bring a little bit of fluffy happiness to their day. Um, if you go to the next slide, we're not just there for the patients, we are also there for the doctors and nurses and all the hospital staff, um, because hospitals are hard places. Serious things go on there. And um, if we can be a little bit of cute love, that's what we are there for. And if you go to the next one, this is at UML. We don't do this one now. I just kind of ran out of time to keep all of this up. 
But at U of L Hospital here in Louisville, we worked with medical detox patients. So these were patients who um, had addiction issues, and the hospital had a medical program where they could wean them off of their addictions using medication. It was really fascinating. I didn't know anything about that before because I am most definitely not a doctor. Uh, but what we would do there is we would sit in kind of a group setting and just let the patients love on the dogs. And it really opened up conversations. I mean, heart wrenching stuff went on there. And it just shows the power of dogs and what they can do to help people. Um, on that note, let's see. So I have here, um, what is this? This is a publication. I don't know if you can see me very well, but it's a publication from the Texas Medical Center. They did a whole thing on uh, therapy dogs once. And I see here, that's a picture of Denny with her favorite patient of all time. The patient's name was Kayla. And Kayla um, had leukemia, and she was undergoing um, very lengthy treatment for her leukemia. And I wanted to read to you a quote from the article. Um, so Kayla says, you can't even describe how happy it makes you to see a dog at your door. Um, it goes on to say, uh, Kayla, who had been in, the, in and out of the hospital over the past 12 months, has been waiting all morning to see one therapy dog in particular, Denali, also known as Denny, a six-year-old Great Pyrenees. Kayla says, I have three dogs at home and I was used to seeing them every day. Last time Denny visited, I couldn't do anything. I hadn't been able to eat for three weeks, so we just laid on the floor. She was the only reason <clears throat> I got out of bed. So that's why we do what we do at hospitals. It, it, you know, on that day that she's talking about, it probably didn't occur to me that we were doing anything out of the ordinary, but it meant something to them. And yeah, you just never know how what you're doing can make a difference for another person. Anyway, going on to the next slide, airports. Okay, a little bit less serious than hospitals here. Uh, when we lived in Texas, another Texas story, uh, we were therapy dogs at um, Bush Intercontinental Airport. We were actually the uh, original therapy dog program there. And that was a lot of fun. If you want to go to the next slide, I think I have several pictures here of us at the airport. So uh, on the left, it's Abby and Simon waiting for the monorail, the tram that takes you between terminals. Uh, on the right, it's Simon saying goodbye to my husband at the airport. Um, if you go to the next slide, you definitely want to have happy pilots. Um, so we were there to help ease their stress a little bit that day. And on the next slide, we also partnered with United um, at some of the airports where United had a big hub. Uh, we would work with them during especially busy travel seasons uh, like Christmas, Thanksgiving, spring break. That might be about it. Um, but we would be there to help de-stress passengers who were having delays or were just really um, not happy about having to travel during busy seasons, which I totally get. If you go to the slide. Uh, Christy, this is Hillary. I'm going to quickly interrupt you. Apologize. Um, it's 1230. I'm OK to continue going. And folks, you're welcome to stay. But if you need to leave, this is being recorded. So you can catch it later, too. OK. But and I don't, I don't think I have too much more. I think we're about to the library portion. So I will, I will pick up the pace from here because I don't want to take away everybody's afternoon. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Uh, okay. Uh, if we go to the next one, let's see. Here we go. This is what we are here to talk about today. Um, let's see here. So when we first started doing our therapy dog thing all those many, many years ago, oh, um, Let's see, question here. Do you all operate in Richmond? Um, so I, we can. Um, if you reach out to Possibilities Unleashed, if we have teams in probably the Lexington area who are available to drive to Richmond, I would say yes. Um, it's, it's pretty, we'll go pretty much anywhere that we have people who have the time to go. That's kind of the big thing, like right now. Like I, I do a lot of stuff here in Louisville. 
if I have time, I will go to Lexington. Um, I don't usually, but yeah, reach out to Possibilities. Uh, if you go to their website, they have a form that you can submit with your request to start a reading program there. And what they'll do is they'll send it out to all of the therapy dog teams and see who can. Um, and if if we don't get back to you, don't take it personally. We just, we're way short on volunteers right now. And uh, we do have, some volunteer teams that are retirees who have a bit more flexibility with their schedule, but most of them are like me where we work a lot. And uh, so, yeah, we're, we're doing the best we can. All right, um, so back to libraries, here we go. Um, the very first therapy dog visit that I ever did was at Scott County Library back in 2009 with Denny. And I had no idea what I was doing going into it. I had no idea what I was even really there for. I was like, oh, I like to read. I like dogs. Let's put the two together and see what happens. Best decision I've ever made, I do believe. So in that first visit, I realized a few things. I, I realized that it's very important to help reading be fun for kids. Um, I realized that there are a lot of kids who are not reading at the level that maybe you would expect them to be able to read. Um, I, I, you know, when you see a, a 10 year old who's struggling to read biscuit books, that was pretty alarming to me because I've, I've always loved to read. It's never been a struggle for me, but I realized that that's not the case for all kids. So I realized that this is something that we could do to make a teeny tiny difference in a kid's life. If we can make reading fun, if we can make it a happy event, that even if they're not good at it, they want to keep trying, then it's totally worth it. And the good thing about reading to dogs is that the dogs aren't going to be critical. They don't judge. They're not going to laugh if the kid gets a word wrong. And I'm certainly not going to do any of those things. So we're there to make it a happy experience. So if the kid wants to read to the dogs, they can read as long as they want to. They can struggle with all the words. I'm there to help if they need it. If they don't want help, that's totally fine. They can read at their own pace. If it's a child who does not feel comfortable reading or they can't read yet, I'm happy to read to them. Or say Simon and I can read to them. That kind of works too. Or if it's a very small child and they just want to look at the pictures in the book, that's okay also. Uh, so we will tailor our reading session with a child to the child's needs and wants. Um, we, we do not follow a set uh, schedule with what we do at all. Typically, um, when we go to a new place to read, if you want to go to the next slide, I have a few more pictures of libraries here. Oops. I'm bleeding. <clears throat> um, what we do is we have an assigned place in the library. Sometimes it's in the kids section. Sometimes it's in a conference room. Um, it's up to the library where you want to stick us. We don't really care. Uh, we'll usually bring a blanket for the dog to sit on. Because like Simon here, he sheds a lot. And I, I feel for anybody who has to vacuum up after us, even with the blanket, we do leave some little fluff balls behind. Um, and then some librarians will have signups ahead of schedule. So, you know, the week or so leading up to our visit, um, they can have parents sign their kids up for it. Or sometimes it's the day of, you know, have a little list of who all wants to read to the dogs. And if you have that list, then you can decide how long each child is going to have. Sometimes it's 10 minutes, sometimes it's 15 minutes. Sometimes if we don't have a big gathering, we can spend a whole lot more time with the kids and they can read a whole bunch of books if they want. Um, when the kid gets there, the librarian will walk them over to us, sit down, we'll do some introductions. I'll say, hi, this is Simon and talk about that for a little bit, a uh, whole little get to know you session. And then we can get to the reading. And that's where the fun part is. If you go to the next slide. Um, oh, here, read to the dogs. That's the at Scott County. They have that little banner. And on the picture, it's it's Baxter and Patches. 
who are my dogs, and then uh, Phoenix, who is another one of the therapy dogs in our group. Um, and so, yeah, that's it. Then we just sit and we read, and it's a whole lot of fun for all of us. I, I must say, I have become quite the connoisseur of kids' books over the years. Um, let's see, what else have we seen happen? We, we have worked with a lot of children with autism over the years, and I have found that to be quite fascinating because they may not interact with us, the people, very much, but they sometimes will really open up to the dogs. And that's kind of special to see. Um, and then there's another little, if you go to the next slide, um, some more pictures of dogs doing their things. Um, lots of libraries will set aside uh, some books for the kids to choose from uh, to make it a little bit easier for them to figure out what to read to us. Uh, lots of times it'll be dog themed books or something seasonally appropriate. Um, but one, one little girl that comes to mind that we've worked with for several years, she, she was really struggling to read when I first met her. Um, really slow going through some books and some kids, like young kid books. And now she's reading chapter books without pictures and, and she's understanding what she's reading. And it's just so much fun to see them progress that way. Um, one of the things that I like to do with kids as I'm reading with them is I want to make sure that they are comprehending what they're reading. And so after they read a page, we'll stop, we'll talk about it, we'll look at the pictures and, and I'll speak for Simon and say, wow, Simon thinks that's really funny. Have you ever seen a purple elephant like that or whatever the thing is that we're reading about? Um, so yeah, that's, that's that. And if we go to the next slide, I think we're about to the end. Yes. So here's um, Baxter, Patches, and Simon uh, saying hello to all of you. Um, they do work hard. They love their jobs. If they didn't, we would not be doing this. One of the things that Amy asked me when we first started talking about doing this is, what are some of my favorite books? And um, I have a stack of them here. Uh, I, I was assuming you all meant um, favorite kids books <laughs> because my personal list of favorite books is very long. But for kids books, I will share with you the ones that I think that I have enjoyed the most over the years, so much so I bought them. Um, this is one, this is called The Day the Crayons Quit. It's hilarious. I, for the first time about a month ago, oh my goodness, it had me in stitches. The kid who was reading it could barely get through it because the kid was laughing so hard and I was laughing so hard. So you know that's a good book. For really beginner readers, Sheep in a Jeep is pretty funny. It's a board book. Um, so, you know, big pictures, big font. Um, it's, it's another pretty funny book. I love the funny books. Um, since I have Great Pyrenees, if you all have seen the Madeline Finn books, um, it's about a Great Pyrenees, and it's Madeline Finn and the Library Dog, Madeline Finn and the Therapy Dog. I think that's the newest one. And there's a Madeline Finn and the Shelter Dog, too, that I didn't bring up here. And then one of my dogs is a Sheepadoodle, so part Sheepdog, part Poodle. And so I like Sheepdogs now. So there's Sheepdog and Sheep Sheep, also pretty funny books. And then... Um, I have also learned the hard lesson of some books will make me cry. Uh, one child brought the book called Before You Were Mine, and I thought, oh, well, that's a cute little book. No, no, if you see a child coming with this one, go get the tissues because they're going to do something to you. It's about a, um, a kid who's dog passed away and so they got another dog and the child is speculating about what the dog's life was before the dog came to live. Oh gosh, it just tears me up. One of the pages says, before you were mine, they couldn't have known what they had in a dog like you or they would have never let you go. Especially hard for me because all of my dogs are rescues and some of them had very hard lives before they came here. So anyway, beware of that book um, if you see that one out there. Anyway, um, I think that's everything. Did I get through that in a good enough time? Hillary, oh, was that? <laughs> no, that's that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, that's that's great. And let me did I'll just check and see. Oh, here's your contact information. 
Um, I don't know if you're seeing this comment from Lolita in the chat. Oh, 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 that, that gives me goosebumps. Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah, it, it's, you know, the nursing home visits, when we first started doing therapy dog stuff, we were told that you don't start doing a therapy dog visit to a nursing home unless you're going to commit to doing it every single time because the residents really look forward to it. And I have seen that. I, I remember one month, um, what did I have going on? I think I was sick and so I couldn't go. Oh my goodness, the residents knew that I wasn't there and they were questioning me about where I was that previous month. So it, it makes a difference to them. Um, if people want to participate with possibilities, who should they contact? Um, well, I think that the probably the best way is to either email, call, or fill out. Oh, to volunteer. Okay. Um, well, same type of thing. You can go online to the website, and there's information there about the classes. The first thing to become a, a therapy dog person with the group is to show up at one of the classes and get evaluated to make sure that they... Um, they think that your dog is okay for it, um, and then to take the next step to getting certified and insured. That's the other thing. We are insured. Um, the group holds insurance on all of our dogs, so if anything were to happen, it's okay. We are covered, but we have not had anything happen. <laughs> Let me just state that. At least my group hasn't. I don't know about anybody else, but so yeah, do that. Reach out to, to the group. Show up at a class. I might see you there. I'm usually there about every other Saturday class, especially since I have new young dogs who are working on getting into the program. Um, it's good for them to show up at class. It's even good for the older dogs to get a little tune up every now and then um, to make sure that they haven't lost any of their skills. Did that help? Yes. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> Christy, this is Hillary again. Just wanted to thank you for um, sharing these, these stories and the pictures. I think that those pictures told a lot about how <laughs> How much i mean that, i think about that little boy who was kind of laying that i don't know if it was simon or baxter that was kind of baxter was on his back and the little boy was kind of leaning on him and it just like it was almost um, like a little hug or something so so th that child so that was I, that was one of the first therapy dog visits we ever did yeah that was denny on her back and the little boy was just rubbing her belly and reading a book about dinosaurs i remember it very well well, he's all grown up now. I ran into his mother uh, last year, I guess, at the library. This was at Scott County. And she got to catch up with me about what he's doing these days. And, oh, it was so special. Um, so, yeah, funny how it all comes back around. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, um, thank you again. Thank you for spending time. I know spending your time teaching us today, but for what you're doing, um, it's, it's obvious that it's, as, as Alita has shared that um, it means something to, whether it's a, a toddler or somebody at the later stage in their life. So thank you for that.